Okay, if you've gotten the Smith down, then you're ready for the Karl Marx reading. Um, and you cannot understand Karl Marx unless you understand Adam Smith. You really cannot. Um, the common misunderstanding out there is that these two are opposed to each other. No, they're not. Marx is built on top of Smith, um, and you're going to see Smith's um, basic theory of supply and demand and the need for free trade is at the heart of Karl Marx. He, there's no disagreement there. <clears throat> okay, and So what you're going to see with Karl Marx is that they're writing, he and Engels, and really it, it is it is Marx because he's got the better beard, um, but also he was the more of the intellectual um, behind uh, Marx's thinking. Well, obviously, um, but he was the real, the face of Marxism and the mind behind Marxism. Um, you know, if you know how the, you wrote Das Kapital and others. And they're writing, this is important, about 75 years after Smith. They have witnessed what has gone on in Smith um, with industrialization. They've seen it now for 75 years. And I want to be clear about this. Um, they are building their ideas, um, and really it is Marx, building his idea on top of Smith because they've seen it go down and they know how it's working, and they know what's going on, the implications of it. So let's jump right in and check out what's going on, okay? <clears throat> so about 75 years after Smith and industrialization, they've seen it, um, and one of the things that Marx is going to point out is that it already exists. Let's go to P1, and there's these kind of famous sayings in here. There's no real thought behind them, but they're famous. A specter is haunting Europe, a specter of communism. That is a metaphor, as if the specter of communism is a ghost coming up, Ooh. Um, and that is the fear of most folks who, you know, um, really endorse industrialization, um, that, oh my god, look at what's coming up. <clears throat> okay, so Marx mentions that at the, at the start, and then he says this, to this end, various nationalities have assembled in London and sketched the following manifesto to be published in English, French, German, Italian, Flemish, and Danish. What, they're, what he's saying here is that this, <laughs> this is like the Declaration of Independence, is what it is. Marxism exists. It's the reality. It's, it's communism is what it is. It exists, and this document, what you're seeing, is not so much an intellectual analysis. It is a public declaration. That's what it is. <laughs> so, um, and jumping in, he says, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Okay, so let me get into that. <clears throat> And so things are getting bumpy and everything, but this is a declaration of rank, the rationale and the goals that he has for communism that have come together from other nations and other people. And so communism is already a movement. Okay, and let's jump in. <clears throat> P uh, P three. What he states states right here is that all class struggle is pushing history. So the history of all, all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. All history. That's not a throwaway line. This is at the core of uh, you know, communist thinking, is that it's moving in a line. History is. And the thing pushing it across is class struggle. That's what's known as a teleology. It's got a beginning point, and it's got an end. And what Marx is going to argue or uh, put out here is that this is just happening. It is not somebody deciding. It's not, you know, a movement here. It is something that's going on with or without us. It's going to happen. <clears throat> okay. So that's teleology, and he's saying class struggle is what is pushing history across the page. Okay. Um, and then he spells out these, free man and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guild master and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed. He says these are just class classes over history, and it's class struggle. They've been fighting in this form and that form and that form. It's just been class struggle pushing history all along. Stood in constant opposition to one another, carried out in uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fights, a fight <clears throat> that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or the common ruin of the contending classes. So in other words, either they reorganize things after all these years of fighting with each other, they either reorganize things into a new class struggle, or everything fell apart, <clears throat> and we had anarchy. 
So what you're seeing right now is that you're, once class struggle starts becoming apparent, in other words, it gets seen, everybody understands that we're going to fight for a while. We either reconstitute ourselves into a new order where we still have oppressor and oppressed, or we fall apart. <clears throat> okay. So uh, what Marx is going to argue here is that we are getting to a crisis point. So we're either going to reorganize things or it's going to fall apart. That's what he says from the beginning. Okay. So feudal systems, industrial systems, it's the same thing all along, just different mass. It's the same, same thing going on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so jumping up to the bourgeoisie and how revolutionary they've been, because I'm telling you right now, they, when it comes to revolution, there ain't nobody like the bourgeoisie. Um, <clears throat> they are more revolutionary than anybody else in the Marxist sense. Okay, let's take up to 14. Um, and I should mention uh, in paragraph 7 that our epic, the epic of the bourgeoisie, um, the bourgeoisie is a kind of Frenchy term. It just is, uh, really means upper middle class. These are the people who have the capital. They can move it wherever they want. It, it was a distinguishing uh, feature. It was not a nobility. In other words, it wasn't a family line you were born into. You just got a pocket full of cash and you got a lot because daddy gave it to you or whatever you've got cash you're in the bourgeoisie it doesn't matter who your daddy was as long as he gave you money you're part of the bourgeoisie um, these are the people who are making <clears throat> calling the shots in capitalism okay um, <clears throat> the feudal system of industry so in other words they had industry back then in the uh, middle Evil, ages in which industrial production was monopolized by closed guilds now no longer suffices for the growing wants of the new markets. In other words, this is the way they did it yesterday, but it ain't working anymore. <clears throat> the manufacturing system took its place, so industrialization did a much better job. A lot better job. And this is very important to keep in mind. Marx is watching Smith's basic ideas that were behind industrialization. He's watching them take place. The misconception that is so often out there is that Marxism is against Smith's approach to economics. It is not. What Marx was watching is that Smith took root and it drove industrialization. It is more productive. It is more efficient. Guildmasters were pushed aside by the manufacturing middle class. Division of labor between different uh, corporate guilds vanished in the face of division of label, labor and in each single workshop. In other words, this industrialization destroyed the old world order. And one of the words I want you to make that might strike people a little bit odd is the word reactionary um, gets brought up a few times here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, um, but reactionary essentially means that this person wants to go back to the way things were. And I want to be very clear, Marx does not want to go back to the way things were. He does not want to go back to the medieval um, ways of doing things, the feudal system. That's not it. <clears throat> he is saying this has been by far the most productive, productive reconstitution of society ever, by far. Okay, so he does not want to go back to the old system. That's the reactionary response to what they're seeing take place in the industrialization. They want to go back. That's not Marx. Okay. So the bourgeoisie has historically played a most revolutionary part. In other words, they've been the most powerful revolutionaries in the history of the world. They have reconstituted society by far at a greater degree, um, in a greater, uh, you know, in a, a larger uh, scale than anybody ever has. The bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, and it always is, um, has put uh, an end to all feudal patriarchal idyllic relations. It has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors. Notice he does not believe that the nobility is somehow naturally superior. It's in quotation marks. But he does recognize that the industrialization has destroyed that old order. Okay, It's just torn it apart and left no other nexus between people than naked self-interest, than callous caste payment. It's not that he's saying it shouldn't happen. He's just noticing that it is happening. It has drowned out the most heavenly uh, ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, 
of Philistine sentimentalism in the icy waters of egotistical calculation. In other words, industrialization, capitalism has reduced everything that used to be held dear, natural superiors, religious ecstasies, um, religious, you know, our enthusiasm for chivalry and all these other things. It says, forget it. Show me the money. That's what it's done. He's not either criticizing or endorsing. He's recognizing. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> it has resolved personal worth into exchange value. That is exactly what Smith said. What somebody is worth is what he or she can exchange his or her skills for. That's a wealthy human being, is the one who can exchange his or her skills for more money. That's why the doctor who can exchange his or her skills for more money is wealthier than the carpenter um, who can exchange his or her skills for less money. That's why. <clears throat> okay. Um, on, uh, freedom, he brings in free trade. That is right out of Smith. So please understand right from the beginning that Marx is built on Smith. It is. He is recognizing that it has already taken place. It's not a matter of endorsing. It's not a matter of criticizing. It's recognizing what has already happened. Come to terms with it. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's move on a little bit here. He mentions uh, free trade as the new ideology driving the social order. And it, it's very important that to, to know that, and this is based a little bit on our last unit, this is an ideology that people are subscribing to. Um, now you can go overseas and set up trade and compete with other markets and everybody just stay out of the way while we're boxing this out. Um, as long as we basically follow the laws, we, we're, we're cool to get out of the way. That's the new ideology that's driving the new social order. It is not a matter of what we think God wants, what the Pope wants, what the King wants, what the nobility say we can do with these cattle in this area. It's a matter of, well, what can you trade your cow for? <clears throat> okay, And how do you get more grain here? Who are you, you going to trade with? Um, we can go over to France. and It's whatever you can do with free trade. That's the new ideology. Um, you don't go knocking on the door of the nobility to find out. You just do it. Okay, That's the new ideology. The exploitation of resources and people People and resources are now commodities. What are they worth? What they can exchange for. <clears throat> okay, That's the new ideology. That is the revolution um, that was set up by Smith's writings. That's what took place. That was behind the Industrial Revolution with Smith. It would not have taken place so darn rapidly without Smith's idea there to drive it. The new value system of self-interest is driving the social forces. That is what Marx is pointing out. Self-interest is the new ideology driving the revolutions throughout society. The reconstitution of society is based on the new notion of the individual's interests. That's what's happening. Again, he's not saying it's good or bad. He's just saying this is what's going on. Okay. Let's jump up to paragraph 19. <clears throat> okay. um, the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the rela uh, relations of production and with them the whole relation of society. Um, and this is a phrase we've now become accustomed to, which is innovation. It must constantly, <clears throat> in order to exist, the bourgeoisie, and this, these are the moneyed class people, it wouldn't necessarily be the inherently incredibly wealthy. That would have been in Marx's time the the royalty, um, but it's the people who have either made money, but have money, but aren't necessarily related to the royal family. I just got a lot of cash. The Getty family, for example, was a bourgeoisie family. They had enormous amounts of cash. They could go out and exploit oil resources. They could do that because they had cash, not because of who you know they were related to. They could do that. That's the bourgeoisie. They must constantly innovate. And what Marx points out here, conservation of the old modes of production in unaltered form was, on the contrary, the first condition for, uh, of existence for all earlier industrial classes. All in earlier classes had to hold on to the way things are. We do things the way we've done things because we've always done things, and that keeps me in power. For the bourgeoisie, there's a big difference. They must constantly 
innovate. We must produce the most effective way of production, of producing oil, of having trains, of making food, of everything. We must make the most productive way and constantly keep doing it because you know what? This guy's going to come along and come up with a better way. If we don't find the best way, the most efficient way, the most productive way, somebody else is going to come along. That characteristic of revolution in the means of production is a characteristic that is part of this current class structure. So there's always been uh, class conflict all along, but the one aspect the bourgeoisie bring in is that they must always innovate, must always revolutionize the means of production in order to hold their position as the top dog within society. <clears throat> okay, All fixed fast frozen relations with their train of ancient and vulnerable um, venerable um, prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify, so they constantly are revolutionized. So this innovative spirit is built into the bourgeoisie when they come in. And we again, we recognize that you, you know that you can't do things the way your granddaddy did. That's become a characteristic of the new society in industrialization, okay? <clears throat> All that is solid, yeah, 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 you get it. So this is the characteristic. Um, but jumping ahead a bit, <clears throat> okay? Um, solidifying classes and civilizing people. So the social conditions are always in flux because the means of production are always in flux. But what's happening while they're constantly revolutionizing is there a solidification of classes and they are constantly, in order to keep reaching out, they are civilizing peoples, different groups. This, this is the non-stop expansion of markets that must take place in industrialization. <clears throat> you will get a solidification of classes into a bourgeoisie and a working class, um, but you will also get this constant searching of new markets um, <clears throat> because they must keep constantly looking for new people to buy what they can produce at the cheapest cost. <clears throat> they must constantly do that. Okay, so. <clears throat> The bourgeoisie, by the rapid improvement of all industrial uh, instruments of production, by immensely facilitated the means of communication, draws all, even the most um, barbarian, even the most barbarians, barbarian nations into civilization. That's what. It, that's the expansion of capitalism. The cheap prices of commodities are the heavy artillery with which it forces the barbarians and intensely obstinate hatred of foreigners to capitulate. How do you move into a new market? sell them more affordable, nice stuff. That's how you do it. <clears throat> um, that's how they break down cultural barriers. So before, <clears throat> people were always in a very conservative mode. We keep things the way they were. We keep things the way they were. We don't let foreigners into our, uh, but look at that nice, boy, that stuff's kind of nice. Now we let them in. <clears throat> we let them in because they have their stuff, and we like their stuff, and it, it doesn't cost that much. And now we've become a market. And guess what? They want to hire us now to set up their new factory. That is the expansion of the bourgeoisie and of industrialization and of capitalism. It compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst, to become bourgeoisie themselves. In one word, it states the world after it creates the world after its own image. That's what it's doing. It's expanding and civilizing all these nations into the bourgeois uh, state of mind. That's what he's recognized. And the expansion of capitalism and industrialization was a very, very much a reality in, in, throughout the Industrial Revolution. The bourgeoisie keeps more and more doing away with the scattered state of the populations um, of the means of production and of property. This is the aspect I mentioned here. It's solidifying classes and civilizing people. That's what it's doing. <clears throat> it's making a very clear working class and a very clear bourgeoisie. That's what's happening. The bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie is bringing all the working class potential together into a single location here in the city at this point. And they're all basically paid subsistence wages. And we keep them there. And we put them, we bring them out of the country all into this town or this city, this, yeah, we're going to put them all in Detroit and put them all together. Or we're going to bring them all together here in Houston 
all together. And that's what it's doing. It's moving everybody out of the uh, country and into the towns, into the cities, and basically paying them similar wages. And that's what's part of industrialization. This is by far the most powerful social influence in history. Okay. Um, let's go to t uh, 25. The bourgeoisie during its uh, rule of scarce 100 years. It's not even quite 100 years. <clears throat> Again, Smith was describing what was starting to go on in his time, even though they didn't quite understand it. Um, it's 75 years, basically, since Smith has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations together. <clears throat> Keep that in mind. Marx is recognizing that industrialization is the most massively productive social organization that the world's ever seen. Okay? It is. He is building what he's going to describe on top of Smith. He understands Smith. He recognizes Smith. Okay? It would be stupid to argue otherwise. <clears throat> okay? So all that stuff I told you about Smith, Marx doesn't disagree with a darn thing in it. He recognizes it. A matter of disagreeing with Smith now would, by 75 years later, that would be kind of goofy because it's so obvious. Okay, and in Smith's day, it was a theory that was a little more abstract and debatable. By Marx's day, it's it's not debatable. It is a theory, it is, but it's so reliable and it's so prevalent, it is clear. Um, well, let's go through this. Um, go down to the next one. This is where Marx is distinct from Smith because he gets into the conjuring trouble and productivity. Um, he is recognizing the product, uh, productive forces are far greater, but then he uses this metaphor. <clears throat> okay. Into the place that stepped free competition accompanied by social and political constitution, adapted to it, the economic and political sphere of the bourgeoisie. Okay. They, they changed the world. Okay, 28. This is a metaphor, and it's a, a really subtle one. A similar uh, movement is going on before our eyes. So they already had their day in the sun, and boy, did they change the world. And man, they are more productive than anything the world has ever seen by far. Marx is acknowledging that. But then he's saying something else is going on, and they're not quite aware. Modern bourgeoisie society bourgeois society with its relations of production and exchange and of property. A, a society that has conjured up. By conjuring up something, you're using magic to bring something up, and it's somewhat ominous, is what it is. Such gigantic means of production and of exchange is like a sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he is called up um, by his spells. In other words, he didn't mean to bring it up, but, uh-oh, what's that? <clears throat> That's what Marx is saying is a production. He's going to say this is naturally produced by industrialization, and that is what he goes on with a little, a little bit later on in 28. And this is what you need to understand about Marx, is about these crises. It is enough to mention the commercial crises by their periodic return. Put the, into the exist, put the existence of the entire bourgeois society on trial, each time more threateningly. In other words, these crises that are happening, that are built into economics, or, or into industrialization, they're happening, and each time they're getting worse. What? Huh? Yeah. In these crises, a great part, not only of the existing products, but also of the previously created productive forces, are periodically destroyed. So with each of these crises, a lot of our means of production that are so dang good are getting destroyed. <clears throat> there breaks out an epidemic that in the earlier epochs would have seemed an absurdity. It's, this is going to be the weird thing. We would never have thought this before. The epidemic of overproduction. <clears throat> okay? There is too much supply, not enough demand. We made too much of whatever it is that there was a demand for. That's it. That is what industrialization does. It has, it is so incredibly efficient and productive that periodically it overshoots the mark. And this is very important. If you go back to Smith's model 
of supply and demand being interdependent upon each other in order to produce value. Once you overproduce, once your supply outstrips your demand, and that is exactly what industrialization will do, <clears throat> you will get plummeting prices. The value of the demand for that supply is going to go down. It's going to um, you know, absolutely collapse. That is a bubble market, what we would understand today as a collapse, or a, a market that's gone through a bubble, or you know, it's been overproductive. It's a glut. In oil terms, they would call it a glut. In uh, internet terms, they called it a, you know, the internet bubble. It bursts. And this was going on in Marx's day. It's very important to understand that, number one, he is built on Smith. Marx is built on Smith. He is not in opposition to Smith. That is an error. Marx is built on Smith, but Marx is as the... <clears throat> Um, the nicer position of being 75 years later and being able to look back and see the problems that Smith could not have foreseen um, as industrialization developed and took place. Marx has now seen it happening. And this is a problem in Smith's theory. It's a weakness or a blind spot that Smith really couldn't have foreseen. That when you get an over... He didn't know how, how productive this thing was going to be. And this is the conjuring up of a spell, <clears throat> or conjuring up of you know some kind of problem here. It's that overproductive capacity and the collapse in markets. We saw this back in 2008 when we have too much housing, and the housing market collapsed and brought with it the banking industry. So we produced too many houses. We had that bubble. The banking industry supplied too much money. People bought up bought up houses like crazy, and then the whole darn thing collapsed. Um, when the loans started to go bad and everything, and they brought down the banking industry with them. That's the kind of thing that Marx exactly was talking about. It's that overproductivity and <clears throat> what it creates are enormous problems. And why? Because there's too much civilization. That's that expansion of the means of production. Too, min uh, too much means of subsistence. Too much industry, too much karma commerce. The productive forces at the d um, disposal of society no longer <clears throat> tend to further the development uh, of the conditions of the bourgeois, uh, bourgeois property. On the contrary, they have become the powerful, too powerful for the, uh, their, these conditions, by which they are fettered, and so soon as they overcome these uh, fetters, they bring disorder into the whole bourgeois society, endanger the existence of the bourgeois property. That is the problem that is created by industrialization is that overproductivity is eventually going to collapse if they don't foresee it coming. <clears throat> and boy, they don't see it coming often. Okay, So that's the crisis that Marx and Engels saw happening over and over and over again in the productivity of uh, industrialization. They don't have a thumbs up, thumbs down view. It's not... <clears throat> there's a common misunderstanding that Marx and Engels were against um, capital, uh, capitalism. It's not... It's, this isn't baseball. Um, they were just watching what was going on and watching these collapses repeatedly. They did believe in the teleology of history, that what would happen during these crises is that there would be a revolution, that the working class would seize the means of production that the bourgeoisie essentially established with their money. <clears throat> the working class would seize the means of production and would take over the factories and take over all these um, industries here, there, and everywhere, and would then you know, rein it in, and keep it more under control. That didn't happen. That is the blind spot within Marx. The blind spot within Smith is that these these means of production would, would go too far. He didn't see that. He didn't foresee it, and he never saw it in his time. Marx had seen it, and he saw these as opportunities for revolution. It never happened the way Marx said it would. <clears throat> it didn't happen. I, I know some people will point to, well, China and Russia, um, with the Soviet Union, well, they hadn't been industrialized by the time they revolutionized. Um, they were Marxist revolutions um, of uh, agricultural countries. Both Russia and China were, at the time of the um, Mar Communist revolutions, were um, agricultural. Marx saw this happening after industrialization. It did not happen the way Marx spells it out. The teleology did not lead to that type of a revolution where the working class sees the means of production. But still, he was watching these crises happen. Okay, 
So if you can get that down, if you get the relationship between Marx and Smith, you'll be in good shape. And then we're going to bring Maynard Keynes on stage and have him address it. But you must understand Smith and you must understand Marx if you're going to understand Keynes. <clears throat> and if you get that down, you're in good shape. Take care, you guys.